Greetings and welcome back to another discussion. I think this discussion today is going to be very topical. I have uh, a friend, uh, know him as a YouTube analyst who uh, pays attention both to YouTube and the world markets based in Asia as well. And without question, we'll be talking about the uh, current uh, crisis, for lack of a better word, its impact economically, its effect on YouTube, and uh, perhaps as an addition how different countries are handling it. It was only a matter of time till a discussion of this sort was going to take place, given the, the gravity of the situation. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I guess I'd like to start maybe with uh, the idea that we see countries in the world, and you're based in Asia, handling this very, very differently. Um, where I live, uh, in Europe, I live in Germany, but it's it's very very differentiated. It's it's very quote unquote diverse the response and indeed the the degree of severity. Um, right now, for example, we see a trend uh, in that Spain is fast approaching Italy. Probably will overtake it as the worst country uh, to be in in terms of the consequences of this crisis. Uh, Italy, of course, is terrible. Germany has the lowest per capita in Europe, perhaps in the world now in terms of, uh, I'll refer to it as turnover. Uh, I think everyone knows what I mean by that. And uh, the United States, unfortunately, is quote-unquote number one. And yet in Asia, um, it's hard to get transparency in terms of continental China, but we see places like Taiwan, uh, South Korea, Japan, handling it quite differently, particularly with regards to the social distancing uh, stuff. So maybe you know you can uh, give us some of the the Asian angle versus the Western approach and some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So the Asian experience with coronavirus, of course, varies from country to country. But I think it's a fair assessment to say that uh, both from my observations of the news and firsthand experience, frankly, they handled it better. No matter the country you name, uh, ignoring China, they handled it better than the West. You can attribute this to experience with SARS and even MERS to a lesser extent. I mean, here's the reality. Um, you ask any Chinese, Japanese, Korean person, Taiwanese person, you know, even a Southeast Asian, everyone remembers SARS. And, you know, to their credit, the uh, various medical establishments and governments of these countries all spent the time fruitfully. Um, they prepare for this simply because, you know, these pandemics, they seem to originate in Asia, China specifically. And uh, the lessons were learned. You can see the difference in response between, for example, the US CDC and uh, we'll pick the South Korean response just because my familiarity with it. With it. Um, the CDC was lagging behind despite months of early advantage and eventually it came down to it. You saw the early press briefings with the White House you know, Emergency Coronavirus Committee. Essentially their response, they decided approaching early March of all things that they decided we're going to copy South Korea. Um, and it just revealed a total a total lack of ability and preparation, whether it be on part of the test kits, travel measures, and also implementing social distancing. But I think the one thing I'd like to put a spotlight on is, um, for some reason, the West has this panic response, animosity towards wearing masks, which we find now has been much, much to our detriment. Um, you know, here's the reality, despite all the chitter chatter and fighting back and forth online, wearing masks lowers transmission. It's just a fact. And, you know, you can't always just say that the Asian companies had a superior or Asian countries, I should say, had superior organization dealing with SARS and now coronavirus as well. Here's the reality. Many of them have stockpiles of masks already prepared because of the pollution season. Right. So it is, to be fair, it is easier on their part. They already have plenty of masks prepared circulation the infrastructure for it it's easy to you know, tap out that supply and get it distributed and then slow down the spread of the virus. Um, frankly, because of the lack of need, uh, obviously the air quality and lack of air pollution is better in the West and also to the social stigma of wearing a mask, um, that you can see that resulted in two very different responses to it. But of the two, I think that's most important is the normies animosity towards wearing masks. Because for some reason, and I'd like to get your opinion on this too, for whatever reason, People saw wearing a mask as a sign of like panic you know, and, and being a conspiracy theorist. And you could see there was a lot of deliberate misinformation um, put out about wearing masks on part of the medical establishment, frankly. Um, 
you can see every single oh almost finished this in a second you can see almost every single layer of the response in the west whether it's the un who ignoring the 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 crisis siding with china warning people against masks not to bother you don't need them they're useless china's got this under control it can't transmit you you can even see examples of the world health organization posting on twitter but how there's no sign that the coronavirus can be transmitted human to human there's no need to worry yeah how well that aged right so we had a total societal uh, meltdown and failure to respond properly, I think mainly attributed to our mentality. People don't like seeing the norm shaken up and wearing masks was a sign that, oh, something spooky was going to happen. And I, frankly, I think it scared people much to our detriment. Because now you can see the transmission rates in the West are far, far worse than they were in Asia, despite the virus originating there. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there, um, not just the mask part. Um... I mean, bit of historical irony, for those of you who don't know, uh, the bubonic plague, sometimes known as the uh, swarthy uh, end of all things. Well, this video is going to be demonetized anyway, the Black Death. <laughs> um, it, it originally came from China. Um, that so was a sort of uh, fit of history. Then there was a, a plague in the year of Justinian. and Anyway, that's kind of a, a bit of irony here. But yeah, I'll, I'll start with the mass bit. Um, I think the angle there, there's a there's this cultural social stigma. I lived in East Asia myself. A place like South Korea, depending on where you are, is is very polluted. So it it was relatively normative at times. But I think what people were failing to get was this uh, some of the subtleties here, as in masks help. They're not perfect. Even a makeshift mask. So the idea was it's not a hundred percent proof. Well, so what is? Uh, by way of analogy, um, if you wear a seatbelt, you're going to have a better chance of surviving a car accident. Is it guaranteed? No, analogy. no, but it's a better chance. So if you go free, if you you know free for all it, no seatbelt, and want to be cool, you're you're at higher risk. So yeah, that even dusk masks, you know, they're not perfect, right? The ones that sort of block out sawdust when you're engaging in carpentry or whatever. Well studied, they lower transmission. It's just yeah, a fact. Yeah, even even makeshift. I tend to make use of a, of a t-shirt that I, I weave around my... Uh, right, I mean, so quadrant. why do they tell you to cough and sneeze into your arm? I mean, that's, in a way, an ad hoc mask. Yeah. And it's recommended for a reason. It works. Uh, yeah, I think the social... Here's the thing, though, a pandemic, though, a pandemic, the front line is the population, right? That's where the war, if you're going to call it, is being fought in each and every single individual person. And the goal of it when you're fighting a war against a pandemic is you have to educate the public and sometimes coerce them and force them to do the right thing to lower transmission. Every single person you get on board fighting properly is one step closer to victory, if you're going to call it that. Yeah. And uh, um, we should definitely get into this later, but there was incredible either intentional misinformation or inf misinformation from incompetence coming from various government medical agencies and also the World Health Organization to everyone's detriment. We, they lied about numerous topics. Yeah, we will, for sure. On the point of, say, social stigma, I think it's part and parcel of something we've discussed privately, um, and we, we kind of have a, a shared consensus on this, that civilization, uh, by definition, is sort of a, a giant exercise in survivor survivorship bias. Um, and so... The West has been, I, mean, I, I, I rattle on about this privately and publicly all the time, but I like to introduce the concept of borrowed time. I mean, civilization is constantly in a state of borrowed time. The fact that we had five or six quote unquote good decades, I'm not saying there weren't problems, but relatively uh, free of uh, pandemic or uh, what have you, incredibly lucky. I mean, history is just shot through and prehistory for that matter, all manner of pandemics. In fact, you, it, it's it's just part and parcel of, of being on a on a planet with a planet with biotic matter, and it it's it's a game and many, and many times it's a game changer. I mean, I brought brought up the Black Death that was a game changer. A lot of people don't know this, but one of the hugest shifts in populations in Europe, roughly about five thousand years ago, likely occurred due to the introduction of a pneumonic plague that the locals, that were farmers at the time, um, they were not resistant to. So there are all these changes that can take place. And all I'm saying here is, yeah, plague, pandemics, they're the norm. We didn't get past this. And of course, part of this mentality is encapsulated in, in essays like Francis, Francis Fukuyama, the political historian, 1992, the end of history. Some of you might be older, some of you younger. I remember this proclamation, and that's part of this mentality of, oh, it's all good, bro. I'm not saying he speaks this way, but it's like, we're, we're, we're past this. We're past the, 
the age of, of upheaval and, the, and, and, and more, most importantly, the, the age of, of the sorts of things that can affect us at the biotic level. Um, so yeah, part of this is just why wear a mask because we're, we're okay. This, this isn't going to affect me. The West has been too sheltered from these type of biotic threats uh, for too long. Um, Spanish influenza, which, by the way, does not mean it originally in Spain. The reason why it's called that is because Spain was the first to report it. So that's, it, you know, a bit of a misnomer and a dubious honor. For the sake of this video, I actually prefer not to get into the um, Chinese virus debate. I think it's a side issue. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. I'm just bringing that up briefly. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, a century ago, 100 million people, more or less, we forget this very easily. So we have this mentality that sort of, we're not good. Human apes are not good at planning. We're not good at thinking in advance. We're not think, good at thinking about the long track of history. We, we think two or three decades of relative calm is an indication of of whatever. We get used to an instantiation. To, to bring up a political, you know, we can talk about this as well, the possible dissolution of the EU. You look at the Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, and let's say you were born in, I don't know, uh, 1878. You just would have thought it's a permanent fixture. You would never have thought that, you know, after World War I, it would just be over. Um, but these things happen, and, and it's we just get this mentality, whether it's political or whatever, that we're, we're just comfortable. So I think that's really ultimately at the basis of, oh, we don't need to wear masks. Um, social stigma, not looking cool uh, is also part of it. And generally, that's one of the main, I think the main reason why the response has been terrible. I mean, Europe, I, I'm going to have to rant here, you'll forgive me, or rant Please. in a calm fashion. In multiple countries, they had massive events. One of the reasons I would propose, and I think a lot of people are agreeing, Spain is, again, it's looking it's looking to become, you know, sort of runner-up to USA number one on this matter, is because rather ironically and somewhat idiotically, they had a women's march on March 9th of this year. Now, by that time, um, COVID was well un, uh, underway in Europe. Uh, Venice had shut down its festival, uh, I think, prior to that, that they usually have a costume festival every year. It's a centuries-old tradition, um, carnival. And yet they were having this asinine uh, march in Germany. There were many costume festivals going on. And guess what? After all of this, there was a report and an increased uh, number of cases. Now, uh, hindsight 2020, but certainly a better response, I won't say proper, would have been to observe from afar what was going on in China and already in January implement all sorts of prohibitory measures, whether it comes to travel, cancel all the festivals, no, let no women's march. We're talking about 100,000 people potentially in Madrid. And all these things that led to an extremely pernicious outbreak of this in Europe because we got too comfortable and mo, whatever it might be, whether, whether it's the normie ma fun or ma women's rights or take your, take your pick. Um, and all this could have been not prevented, but mitigated in the extreme by taking inventory of what was happening in the Middle Kingdom. Um, and it was just, I was in Germany looking at some of these costume festivals, Carnival, Fushing, they call it, thinking this this is not going to end well, and predictably it didn't. And same with Spain. I was thinking, why? Why? Um, and now Spain is becoming a giant morgue. It's going to overtake Italy. And, um, yeah, I mean, hindsight 2020, 2020, uh, 2020, but, I mean, you were paying attention to this even earlier than I was, but I was paying it reasonably early. And I just thought, this, there's no way this is going to just be a, a Middle Kingdom burger, right? This is going to be globalism, global travel. It's kind of obvious. So the masks are just the sort of small component of this bigger, we're fine, we never deal with anything, civilizations pass these types of hurdles. And I mean, people say, what, the price of freedom is, the, is, uh, is eternal vigilance. Eternal vigilance. Yeah, vigilance. The, the, the price of civilization is eternal vigilance, vigilance. You can't simply just say, well, we had uh, five, six decades and no pandemics. We're all good. You know, we're past this. You know, it's, it's just the flu, bro. It, this is, you know, far more pernicious than the flu, particularly because we're in the early stages. And it's hard to guesstimate these things when you have a long history of, of X but not of Y. So civilization is the definition of borrowed time and survivorship bias. And I'm not very optimistic. I mean, I think the audience knows I have a rather dismal view of human beings, myself included. I'll include myself in that. But 
I'm not optimistic about our ability to be proactive and, and vigilant and, and, and wakeful with respect to these types of things because we just fail repeatedly. A point, and you made the excellent point, sir, on um, sort of needs to be enforced. Well, let's just put the libertarian argument in the coffin now. We now have hardcore empirical evidence that people en masse, on average, do not behave in a responsible way. And then you can, I guess, make some sort of argument of, oh, they weren't raised, right, whatever. The point is, that at least in Europe, um, the countries I'm most familiar with, I'm paying attention to sort of Netherlands and, and Germany, because just prior to the official proclamation, declaration, edict, whatever, from the, the powers that be, of a maximum of two people, I think in the Netherlands three, um, social distancing, shops, clothing, whatever, it was business as, as usual. It's not as if within tw the 24-hour cycle, things had changed extremely. You know, it was the same. It's just that on day X, the day before the official proclamation, it was, let's just, we're, we're going to have picnics in the park. We're going to tongue, tongue kiss each other. We're going to play tennis. Everything's fine. Um, we're going to go out. Have, we're going to have our, our, our lattes. And then official, and then everyone's, oh, wow. But people weren't conforming. And the youth, they were engaging in these, you know, these coof parties and just still drinking. <laughs> Most infamously in the, in, the, um, in the U.S., these spring breakers were caught on camera a couple of uh, weeks ago. And it was just every, every flavor under the sun of irresponsible idiocy from one guy, uh, this Brady character. That, yeah, if I get grown, I get grown. I'm here to party to some female. Like, well, we still find a way to get drunk. So the problem here really is that this, is, this demonstrates that you can't, people are not necessarily going to act responsibly. And talk about what you brought up, sort of informing the public. I've noticed, despite the sort of insistence on social distancing, at least in Germany, that the principles of viral transmission, you could say sort of principles of germ theory, right, they're not being adhered to because I'll see people in the supermarket, which sometimes is limited to the maximum number of people I have in it in an effort to contain this, will touch items, like they'll touch the, the cereal or they'll touch the whatever, the yogurt, and then they'll just rub their eyes and, and ears and, and mouths as if <laughs> as if... There's no risk in that whatsoever. That the so, because the, the problem is everyone is handling this, and it's debatable. I, I've seen all kinds of estimates, but we know at least for a fact that the COVID uh, thingy stays or virus. So it's the videos that demonetize anyway. I keep on forgetting that um, stays on on surfaces for for several hours. At least some people argue 24 hours. So the point is, it's risky, and they're not taking inventory of all the variables. They're saying, okay, we need social distancing. Okay. And this is all. This is really, in my humble estimation, is is bots acting in a somewhat conformist manner to official government edicts without understanding uh, the the mechanics of it all. I mean, it's not just social distancing. Why do people r insist on vigorous hand washing? Yes, you can do that, but you're increasing your risk by touching items and then touching your face, where these mucous membranes are, these receptors. Uh, ACE uh, receptors are that that transmit it. and so I just I look at people and I'm aghast. Um, it's there's just their total insouciance at 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 this, and um, yeah, I mean I, I'm, I'm ranting now, but I, I just it's insane. Um, never mind. You want to see an act? I mean, the lemming behavior. I plan on making a, a video eventually on the psychology behind toilet paper, so to speak, but. The, the monkey see, monkey do. I mean, toilet paper, in case of catastrophe, is the least of your concerns. I mean, people, at least now they're doing it, but they were not stocking up on canned goods. They weren't stocking up on, on things that are going to um, provide some value to survive. They're just just imitating people. Um, herd, herd mentality as opposed to her, herd uh, immunity. You know, not, I don't blame everyone for doing that. I mean, you, the response was so lopsided and late. I don't blame people for thinking, like, maybe they're going to let this get totally out of control. I mean, it's it's an insurance policy on top of the, on part of the no, canned no, food thing. No, so no, 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 but you're missing my point. I'm not talking about canned food's great. I'm talking about toilet paper. Why would you, the people initially weren't buying canned food. They were mostly buying toilet paper. You can't nourish yourself from toilet paper. I don't blame, I, I stocked up too on food and supplements and things and, and, and protein powder. But they weren't, I saw most people were buying hor like ton, literal tons of toilet paper and minimizing the food that, I mean, frankly speaking, you can't consume enough food to use that much. 
that's the issue I take I have. That's the thing I have issue with. Take issue with this sort of hurt, just imitating people. People fighting and breaking out into fights over toilet paper. Not yeah, not... I, I, it is based on um, something that is real. Is that fear of the um, the strength of the supply chain, right? So yeah. we had China shut down. Um, and people were expecting it to hit Mexico and Central America, which is where most of the toilet paper is made. It didn't happen to be that way. But I think it was, I, I do agree on the, the toilet paper just being a reflex, but the general underlying premise was that the supply chain was going to be threatened. It was. I instruct get extended prescriptions on all their foods because, you know, as, as I thought and as we saw, um, China's production of pharmaceuticals was shut down for a brief time, and then afterwards they were threatening the West with it. So, um, yeah, if you, if you have a concern about the supply chain, I totally understand that. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up was something you were talking about, which is what you call the light switch, which I like. So, isn't it revealing that one day it's normal? In fact, people are dancing around in defiance of the crisis, and then a decree comes out. They go see some lines on their computer screen from the government telling them to do this and that, and then the behavior changes 80%. I know people like to say in Asia, oh, you know, they're so conformist, they're collectivists, they're bots, so are we. It, it's just a matter of who's really flicking the, the light switch, as you're calling it. And in our case, we had um, a drunk blind person doing it. That's the only real difference. Well, yeah, I mean, it's. It, I think it, cultures and ethnicities have different degrees of conformity. But yeah, ultimately, we're humans are, are pretty... Uh, pretty robot-y, uh, and um, the the ro the the robotiness, so to speak, is contained in the fact that, they, as I was pointing out, they don't understand the full gravity of this. They think that so social distancing, wash your hands, but they manhandle items in the supermarket and, and touch their vulnerable faces with it. So it's, this is perfect bot behavior. This is not taking again stock of what what this means when you have a, a very dangerous um, matter like this. Let's tie it to civil liberties. Um, yeah. So you see the complaint cropping up about, you know, I don't know about these lockdowns. I think this is an infringement on civil liberties. I mean, uh, and this even at the same time kind of ties into surprisingly people's inability to have an innate understanding of germ theory. I mean, we, we take for granted George Washington, all the founders and framers of the Constitution. I guarantee they weren't washing their hands. Uh, I guarantee that they really had a... Um, a very rudimentary understanding, probably better than the average person, but a rudimentary understanding, probably just a correlational one of germ theory and how diseases spread and, and everything like that. Uh, you know, you have to remember, we really didn't get a good understanding, especially taught in public schools until the 20th century, being frankly honest. You know, the knowledge was slightly there before, but, uh, you know, we take germ theory definitely for and granted. still lacking, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it. you, you got to have at least a triple-digit IQ, I'm saying now from what's going on to actually understand and implement basic controls and protocols against uh, diseases and viruses. Yeah, even smart people, uh, clearly, you know, normal smart people doing white collar jobs don't seem to, to get it. I mean, even now, I guess germ theory isn't well understood. The, the novel- We don't have an innate understanding for it. That's why it ravaged through human populations over and over and over and over up to the 20th century. And even now we're saying we just, we well, don't have brains for it. I mean, you can instruct, but we just don't have brains well, to contend with it. it. It's, it's, That's why viruses are so successful. Arguably, viruses are more successful than our form of life. Well, they absolutely are. It's the issue with, with um, microbes and, and microbiotic organisms in general. It's the same issue we have, you know, fit modern physics has pierced the veil on the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum, but with just normal human sight, we could never have done it. And so for in the entirety of our history, we never thought that there um, there was more variance in, in, in light than what we just saw with our eyes. Um, likewise, without microscopes and, and, and such things, and how are you going to know that microbes or, or uh, microorganisms are, are dangerous? So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just we... Out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, pretty much. It's just how we, we operate. We just... We look at cause and effect and what is actually um, perceived by us as opposed to things that are not within our ability to perceive them. And I mean just purely in the physical sense. So yeah, it's it's just one of those things. Um, whereas I'm, you know, maybe it's because I'm paranoid, but every time I see some guy at the supermarket touch the yogurt and then rub his nose and eyes, I'm just thinking, yikes, i got to get away from this. Yeah. Um, because I... At some point in time, you have to internalize this knowledge. Yeah, I can't see microorganisms either, obviously. Um, but 
still, um, I, I have some understanding of this and, and the, the relevant dangers. And again, libertarianism, I mean, I use, I'm still sympathetic with it. I've always kind of leaned somewhat. In the, you know, a good spirit. I mean, I can't deny that. Yeah, it's it's, but it it failed. The, the the empirical experiment was run. People were not just doing it of their own volition, res, acting responsibly. It required a government mandate, and even then, they still didn't. So it's just, I don't know what to say about that. I mean, it's it's pie, libertarian has always been pie in the sky, um, but I think we see now just how much pie in the sky uh, it is. So it's. You know, on, on responses and what have you, it's it's been terrible. Um, fortunately, in Germany is is overall doing a good job, better than the vast majority of countries in the world, say perhaps or maybe comparable in its own way with Asian countries. Thank the gods. Um, alternatively, other places uh, not so much. And I mean, one theory I have for the Southern European issue is that they're just a much more touchy feely culture, so they're much more likely to embrace you know. Uh, the whole uh, kissing the face, kissing the chin. So that probably was also a factor why Spain and Italy, in addition to some others, is currently ravaged the way it, um, they are being ravaged. Um, but, I mean, on, getting on to some economic, we can't really avoid talking about the Middle Kingdom, unfortunately, because it's, it's well, on our own, the Middle Kingdom is the middle, sort of the centerpiece of all of this. You have the historical precedence of so many <laughs> plagues emerging from the Middle Kingdom. Right. And it's, you know, the, the economic dependencies that have been built up for, for decades now are really showing their weaknesses. Um, I think at this stage, the CCP or however you want to, that we need, the West needs to take a harder line with it, make some sacrifices in terms of paying more for uh, production and, and goods and just let it hang for a while because, um, as you point out historically as well, um, the, the Middle Kingdom, China, is just, their tendrils are in everything. They don't do it through force of arms. This is not like uh, you know the Huns or the Mongol whores. They're just, they do it subtly. And now Australia, for example, is worried about production of medical, uh, pharmaceutical stuff. Um, and, and lots of countries are, as you pointed out that too. Uh, I, I don't know. It, it's, it's a bit of a catch-22. There doesn't seem to be a good way out of it. We're going to, with respect to the CCP, we're going to be taking some pain regardless. I, I, I'm personally, I, I don't know if this is the right route to go down, but I'm going to want to go down the route of more pain to detach ourselves. And it's, it's disappointing. Whatever your views of the European Union are, and I have mixed views. Um, that the petty factionalism that's currently uh, afoot in the European Union, when at the very least we have, you know, a much stronger cultural uh, basis to unify in opposition to the CCP and, and their kingdom, it's it's just really showing just how bad it is because they have a, a pseudo unified front. We don't even pretend to have that. Yes, different countries. Have been, yeah, I mean, I'm. I think this is the time, it could be the time for the European Union to, to show its teeth rather than to just break down to factionalism. And it's very disappointing. I mean, obviously, there's not much to be done about it right now. But I'm curious to hear your perspective on, on the Middle Kingdom, how the West stands in relation to it, and just really how pernicious it is. Because, again, they're responsible for, for covering this stuff up. And then, as you pointed out, for being in cahoots, essentially, with the, the WHO. Um, it's... Uh, it's mind-boggling. Yeah, so it's unfortunate. Um, this crisis will temporarily draw a lot of attention to China, and I think part of it's intentional and part of the, the ruling class. They There is a realization that they really messed this up. And so one for one way for people to blow off steam is they're tempor temporarily allowing people to get angry at China and say maybe say some mean things online. It's a way to blow off steam and deflect blame. I mean, the authorities in the West were caught between a rock and the hard place, right? So. China, just diplomatically, internationally speaking, and we'll get to economics in a moment, they're just a bully. What they do is they take the slightest offense and then immediately hit the nuclear launch button, right? So I told you this before, but there was an example of some Chinese tourists being held up at a hotel in Sweden, and then China in retaliation sanctioned the whole country and then I think caused billions in economic damage, among other things, and harassed some diplomatic staff. 
Um, and so what that does is that kind of creates a reflex fear on dealing with China, and they just act as a united, united front and do this everywhere. So the authorities were caught in Iraq but in a hard place, right? So they overreact or put controls on travel on China, and they know from historical perspective, China will ratchet it up to a 10 and cause more damage than they're trying to prevent. And then on the other side are the Mufun crowd, right? And they, they get spooked and upset and a little bit chaotic if you do anything to interrupt or threaten the Mufun train. So, you know, what do you do? You're caught between a rock and a hard place. I'm not saying the people in charge, frankly, in the West are very competent to begin with, but even especially given considering these circumstances, what was there to do? And so you get the result now. Um, and even when this is all over, you're going to find that we're going to be in a worse position, even though the plague didn't originate in the West. It originated in China. Here's what's going to happen. China initiates it's draconian lockdown, social tracing. I mean, you, some of the measures they have in China are really incredible. And I use incredible both seriously and facetiously. Welding people in apartments, QR, tro uh, QR codes, CCTV tracking. Um, I know there's a lot of debate over the numbers, but I do think just based on how those measures are working in other countries, I do think they've reduced their number of cases. Here's the reality. Lockdowns when dealing with the coronavirus, they do work. We witnessed it happen in South Korea. We've seen it happen now actually in Italy, frankly. I think the, the cases are just now beginning to drop off. So, I mean, it's obvious that lockdowns work, right? So here's the problem. You, you know, you go through a lockdown with China and or you, you, you go through a lockdown in your country and then when it's over, we've been devastated economically because we didn't do the harsh measures as quickly as China did. And then China comes out on the other side stronger than we are uh, because, you know, they still have the manufacturing and probably have incurred less economic damage than than we have and our positions weaker. And part of this, too, is exacerbated. Uh, other channels have covered this by the fact that China, Chinese um, agents of the state acting abroad, use their connections through purchased properties, state owned enterprises operating in Canada, Australia, the United States to go through and fleece us and get all of our masks and protective equipment as much as they could out of all these different countries, whether it's Australia, rural Canada, rural US, you couldn't find them anywhere. And and here's the reality, they had to have gone somewhere. I mean, the US has a massive construction industry. Nearly all the workers have to wear the N95 masks for OSHA considerations. We have plenty of hospitals, the medical system, say what you will in the US, it is robust. It definitely is. And here's the reality, I saw this happening both in the news and on Twitter, the people in hospitals were screaming that they ran out of protective equipment in early March, before this even started, it had to have gone somewhere. And the reality is you had people, you even see them posting videos on social media celebrating it. You had people celebrating, Chinese people, who were acting on behalf of the state, celebrating that they cleared out all the masks and got them into China. Now you see reports that they have a billion mask surplus sitting in China. And now they're parceling it out, and I guess in exchange for other things, and trying to trade it to countries who are suffering from coronavirus. It's such a double whammy. And then one topic I want to get your thought on, which I'll introduce here, is that there was a path to reduce our dependence on China. And actually, it started with something that was very unpopular. It was the TPP. And the TPP would have cobbled together this coalition of Japan, South Korea, Philippines, Taiwan, Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia. And they figured between those three countries, you could kind of recreate a second China. And if you recreated a second China in all those different countries, they would be empowered. They would be taken out of China's sphere of influence. And we could disperse our manufacturing and everyone would be better off for it. Now, the trade-off was so that it would have run roughshod over the U.S. and Canadian economies. It would, at least in terms of supporting domestic manufacturing, and there would have been a price to pay for sure. But here's the reality. TPP didn't happen. The Trump administration canned it, but manufacturing didn't come back anyway. So we got neither. And now we're seeing, it. maybe it happened sooner because of the virus, but now we're seeing that there's a devastating consequence. Here's the situation China's in. They control our pharmaceuticals, especially when it's in such a dire strait right now. The masks, they have the most masks in the world, they're sitting on them. And what can we do about that? China got their economic house in order faster than that we are, we have. And they could just say tomorrow, for example, because we all slash our interest rates to zero or negative and we're flooding the market with printing and QE stimulus. China could say tomorrow, look, uh, we're, releasing, we're releasing bonds, they have a positive interest rate and they're backed by a commodity. And that's when the system blows up. I don't think it'll happen just because of the interdependency, but it's definitely within the realm of possibilities. Yeah. So on the TTP thing, um, yeah. TPP. Oh, sorry, TPP. Sorry, my uh, TPP. I think that, well, part of the strength of China is its 
uh, really, it's I want. I mean, it's not really soft power. You can see it through history. Yeah, but I was going to say it's 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 sort of a mono. It's it's not really a mono. Obviously, there are lots of sort of, but it the the overarching it's almost power. Almost united front. Yeah, every exactly. It's kind of monocultural. It's very ethnically homogenous. I mean, there are a lot of minority populations, but the point is that they're ignored or they're suppressed, so it doesn't really matter. So cobbling together an alliance <clears throat> of that sort with disparate peoples and disparate cultures, languages, I, I'm not sure if it would have been, you know, in that respect uh, as effective. I think it's another case of sort of hindsight 2020, just because... Yeah, it was the path not taken. We don't know what would have happened. Yeah, yeah. So road not taken and all that. Um, yeah, manufacturing hasn't uh, come back. But I, I think that... There is a possibility for, look, I think that China is sort of the threat of our time. Um, you know, I grew up during an era where the Soviet Union was perceived to be. I find what China has been doing far more sinister than anything the Soviets ever did. The Soviets weren't, uh, I mean, they weren't flooding, say, the U.S. and European markets with cheap goods. You know, at least to the extent I'm aware that they did, they did it not to the same degree as China. There weren't these economic de dependencies, in which case when the, 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 the Soviet Union collapsed, you know, whatever economic productivity they had was not really that. Uh, we were aversive. primed for the conflict with the Soviet Union. I mean, through one form or another throughout history, there's always been animosity towards Russia. That's something we could contend with. And, and for better or for worse, actually, Russians, they aren't too different from us. I'm being very broad here, obviously, but yeah. the reality is the West has only been dealing with China relatively recently in a historical perspective. And China, frankly, hasn't been strong until very recently as well. Um, it's a new system. It's a dangerous system and it's an extremely effective system. They're uh, state socialist, ethnocentric, yeah. you know, uh, socialist well, capitalist, capitalism. We can't contend with it. It's just a fact. And we don't pay attention to history. I mean, the boxer rebellion is, I mean... The way they're treating foreigners now in, in, in China sort of mirrors the Boxer Rebellion in a lot of ways. And we know that, and here's the thing, I mean, we, because of what you, the strangle they have, as you pointed out, we're, we're, we can't really, we, the polit politicians, a lot of politicians can't comment on it because they just go, as you, they go full throttle, you know, isolate someone who might have come from China just for, you know, viral containment purposes and they're, they put sanctions on a country. It's, it's. I think that whatever alliance, whether some new version of the failed uh, one, or we need the West in general, and arguably other Asian countries. I mean, Vietnam is no friend of China. They need to... You no, know, if anything, Vietnam would make a natural friend mm. for the U.S. It just doesn't happen, though, for various reasons. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's some it's a separate issue that are historical. But yeah, we, I think China needs to be viewed as very, very dangerous. Um, I, I remember, you remember the propaganda, uh, posters, it, all, every side use it, basically the sort of the giant octopus like tentacle thing. It, yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it wasn't exclusive. It, it, like every side liked to use it back in the day. I mean, the China, the Chinese, the CCP that have their tendrils in various, uh, African operations, not South America. I've heard, um, it, it's insane. And we're, I mean, the only way forward, I think, is to take immense amounts of pain and just try to retake in terms of pain more. Just draw. It could 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 be done. It could be done. Um, the problem and tariffs. I mean, look, I'm not a, an economics expert, but here's a, Japan. Japan, I think, to still this day has a tariff system on on terms of uh, imported goods. I mean, there but we don't because much cheap products. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. There, there are ways that you could kind of deal with this that are not full-on declarations of, of war. Now, I, my concern, though, is if you were to engage in economic warfare with, with China, is that they would actually engage in some sort of real, that, that's how sinister. For style, they will ratchet it up to an 11 yeah. as soon as you do anything. So we're, now, on the other, I mean, on the other hand, a, I don't mean globalism, one world government, but a global alliance where people see a common opponent and in China or the CCP, and just the idea that this is not good might be not a good idea. But on the other hand, talking about ratcheting up, I mean, I would not trust China as far as I can throw. I would think that 
if even if the such a uh, you know general understanding globally occurred, they would then China would become underdogs, but they could just threaten to destroy the whole world with nuclear weapons. I, I think they might even do something like that. That's how crazy they are. I think, I, although maybe their self interest is great enough that they wouldn't do it that way. I don't know. Um, I could just see you go along with it. They don't again. They don't ratchet up to a ten, but you just have to allow the slow advance uh, of it. Here's the thing: this isn't the China of the 1800s and the 1900s when we had the most contact with them. No. Uh, they're ascendant. Um, yeah, you could. I mean, they're strong. They're unified. The average person is on board. They're enthusiastic. They're patriotic. Uh, the criticisms, the, I mean, of the uh, the Chinese government, they only manifest in the foreign territories they're trying to an- annex. I'm talking about. Hong Kong, Taiwan, Macau, those peripheries. Um, this is like Ming 2.0. Um, and you're going to see an attempt to reestablish the tributary system. What China does is they have their tributary states around them, and it's crucial to the core. And uh, you see it being reestablished through your very own eyes today. We're too used to dealing with the fractured uh, century of humiliation China versus the one that's ascending now. Yeah. I mean, the only. The only mild hope or is that, that places like uh, South Korea and arguably North Korea to some degree, but much less so, and Japan and Vietnam could put up some spirited resistance in addition to the sort of the Han uh, tributaries um, like Taiwan. On their own, they can't do it, but there's no reason for them to cooperate. They don't have much solidarity with each other. And again, the historical yeah. natural force is a reestablishment of that tributary system. I mean, that's how it's been every single cycle. The The Ming example I used actually last time was wrong. Uh, the Ming were, relatively speaking, more inward focused. Uh, this would be you know better comparable to one of the predecessor dynasties. It's outward, it's outward focused, it's expansionist, uh, much to our detriment. Yeah. And here's the thing, too. Our, our leaders, for the most part, they're not great, but what they want to do is they just want to rake in the cash, they want to have cheap products, mm-hmm. and they want globalism, right? Um, China's not playing that game. They're, they're not interested in that. They want dominion, not globalism. And when you're playing two different games, you're playing checkers versus chess, right? Checkers players are going to lose. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think, I don't know, you know, from the poor response to COVID to this insistence that, you know, GDP is, I mean, so it's like a Ben, it's a Ben Shapiro meme. Like, you know, everyone's uh, dropping dead in the streets, but, you know, GDP is up 6.3%. It's all good. We're going to have neither, though. Yeah. We're going to have an awful pandemic and we're going to have an economic recession, depression, maybe even collapse. I have some nasty statistics on that, actually. Yeah, on that note, let's, uh, let's have a look at some of those nasty statistics you have on hand. Yep, sure. So, um, I think people on your channel are already predisposed to thinking this way, which is good. But the reality is the the next few years are going to be very painful. Despite what people say, there's no getting around it. They say things like once everybody comes out of their house, it's going to be fine and the stock market's going to surge. It's not. It might go up from a like a monetary policy standpoint. I mean, we are flooding the economy and markets with cash. So maybe they will, but not in terms of real value. Um, people right now, they're hunkered down at home. And so you haven't gone yet gone outside to see the world that's going to emerge from this. And looking at the statistics, it's not going to be pretty. Um, we're, there, I've seen some nasty graphs of weekly claims for unemployment. Um, just last week, there were more people who filed for unemployment in the U.S. than the last three recessions combined in one week. Um, it's... It is absolutely insane. You can, there are various estimates, but right now I think the unemployment rate is sitting total. Like it wasn't even great before this crisis, by the way, but separate issue. It might be sitting around 15%. You could see it as high as 30%. And that's society crushing right there. Um, And what you're seeing is the coronavirus, the impacts of it actually, if you look at the raw statistics, are comparable to a war, like losing a war. So, when the Second World War ended, we have the examples of Germany and Japan, two of the most devastated countries, um, ignoring the Soviet Union, obviously. Germany lost 8% of its population from the Second World War. They lost 20% of their housing. This is important later. And they lost 30% of their industrial production, right? So Japan, on the other side, they lost 4% of their population and then 40% of their industry and 25% of their housing. So. We had a trade-off with coronavirus in the U.S. where the death rate would have sat anywhere. I think people look between 1% to 5%. It depends on how well the health system would have contended to it. So 
with a death rate like that, it's the equivalent to losing a major war. It's not as high, but it's definitely on par with that. And so the solution obviously was to institute these lockdowns because you'd have a death rate on part of, again, losing a major world war. Um, but the, the key thing I was bringing up is the loss in housing. So Germany in World War II, they lost 20% of their housing, and then Japan, they lost 25%. You're seeing those rates of uh, mortgage defaults and other real estate-related problems happening right now just from the fact that people are losing their jobs at an unprecedented rate defaulting on their loans, they're already announcing eviction freezes, suspension of rental payments, the mortgage industry obviously is on total fire right now. <clears throat> so you add all of that up and you can draw a fair conclusion that as sad as it is to compare, it's probably a fair comparison. The damages from this coronavirus might be as bad as Germany and Japan losing the Second World War. And so here's, we have uh, information related to their recoveries afterwards, Germany and Japan. Now, the good news is eventually, obviously, things did turn around, but it's a little sad how long it took. So, the actual bottom of Germany's GDP was 1946, not 1945. So, actually, even after the war ended in Germany, it did another year of free falling, right? So, the very bottom was 1946. Germany's GDP did not recover to pre-war levels. I'm talking like Third Reich, 1942. Hey, goodbye demonetization. Uh, you know, the GDP of the Third Reich, it didn't come back until 1954. And that's with massive aid. And the industrial base, the untouched industrial base of the United States helping out Europe rebuild. Japan, you know, they had a little bit better off. They actually, their bottom was 1945 instead of 1946. They recovered in 1952. No. It's not a good situation. And another fact I'll throw out here before taking your input on this. So the Great Depression came around mainly because of runaway financial damage, which we're all familiar with. In today's dollar, the New Deal was $800 billion. The CARE Act, which actually not enough people have awareness of, it's a very complicated bill. The total stimulus and bailout, everything put together is $2.2 trillion. And that's pro proposed to be the first of many. Um, what we're seeing is unprecedented, and I think you could see a mirror between what happened in, with the destruction of the Second World War, just in a very different way, obviously, with everything shutting down. It's expressed differently. But you're gonna, you could see damage approaching the same level. What do you think about that? It's certainly a possibility. I'm uh, neither an economist nor an expert on economics, but observing what's happening, it absolutely seems the case. W one angle on the economic front I would like to mention um, since we're on the topic, is uh, poss possible, in addition to all the damage, restructuring of uh, things. But, I mean, let's be honest. For years, people were, say, were told, you have to come into the office. And that's still true in a lot of cases. might have been relevant. But now so many people are working remotely, and it's w more or less working out okay. What then, after months of this, is then the excuse people will receive, and you have to come in to do what? to look prim and proper in a chair, um, to commute, to waste money on commuting. So there's that. But I do think that because this is a sort of a biotic thing, right? It's, it's unprecedented, at least in our lifetime. Arguably, you know, we had 9-11. We had, okay, we had the dot, uh, we had the... Um, dot com bubble. I mean, there are a lot of things that happen, but this is, this is new. Uh, I would cautiously agree that we don't know how bad it's going to get, but it could be just as bad as something uh, potentially after uh, World War II. But I think one of the mitigating factors, um, so I'm going to get back to something I know more about. I don't think it'll be as bad as World War II, but we could see even 60% of what happened after yeah. World War II. And we just don't know. We'll know a lot better when we come out of the isolation. It's going to be a nasty world when we come out. Uh, moving away from the economic thing uh, slightly, because again, I have to stress my lack of expertise and more things I do know a lot more about, such as psychology. I uh, pointed this out before, as you know, towards the, the tail end of, say, the Roman uh, Empire and decline, you have the Bread and Circus show. We have the best Bread and Circus show ever in the history of, so of human civilization. We have internet, we have porn, we have video games. I can't help but think that that is going to be maintained until just the, the cows come home. So yes, maybe maybe it'll turn into a depression, 
but the perception will be that it's not quite as bad because people will still be playing Call of Booty and the system will survive. I agree yeah, with you on that one. They'll be for watching various reasons porn, whereas, and you know, obviously after World War II, during the great, the, these were not options. You know, boredom is a is a big thing, and so as long as people have their entertainment, um, that's going to be everyone in, in power is incentivized to maintain those that type of infrastructure. So I think it, it attention. Actually, you notice when this crisis happened, um, HBO became free. YouTube made, I think they took off data caps and limits on the various cable providers, internet providers, cell phone providers. Uh, a lot of a lot of media. Pornhub uh, became more free and ex yes, in exactly. Italy. So you yeah. can see that's a ratcheting up of the bread and circuses, exactly like you're saying. Yeah, but they they have to because I mean, next to this running water, that's what they have to maintain because you can be jobless and totally miserable. But if you, I don't know, lower the cost of having internet connection, you have some ghetto computer or whatever, you can just entertain yourself in the apocalypse in the pseudo apocalypse. And I think this is one tool the powers that be have at their disposal uh, that has never been present. I mean, here's the thing. I mean, it's, it, this is totally anachronistic, but imagine, you know, late Roman Empire with all this stuff. I, I'm not sure if, you know, some, some, something else would have happened, you know. Um, no, I still think it would have disintegrated, but uh, nonetheless, I think that probably based on, things you said and some other people I know who are more economically savvy than I, it could be very, very devastating, but I think it's going to be masked by the mirage of the internet and the mass entertainment we have these days. And so people won't be uh, feeling that. Now, on that front, you see how a lot of the normies, uh, we've shared some images of this on occasion, just thought that the gravy train, and back on the point of sort of survivorship bias, was, was, was endless, that some Instagram thoughts or whatever, they were making money by just existing, and all of a sudden the, the well might be drying up or something's just not working out, and, and they're just, they're in debt. Oh, it is. You can see so many girls are throwing their Cash App and PayPal links into their bios. They're trying to recreate the old system of traditionalism, but like decentralized outsource on the Internet. Times have got a little bit tough. Um, and then immediately, all of a sudden, they're dropping the, the old bravado and pretense and just appealing to men online. Yeah. Although, um, as I pointed out in my earlier video, I, I don't, I can't imagine this being a permanent fixture unless, uh, you know, this goes on for decades and decades. You know. Hello? Yeah, okay, yeah, you're, you're back. Um, so... Yeah, I think I think the takeaway from all of this is that essentially this is unprecedented in our lifetime. Not being uh, prophets or pro clairvoyants, we can't really know exactly what the outcome, but it's not going to be good. Um, the, the outcome is predicated on events that have not yet happened, right? So yeah. you could you could be sitting in a room with George W. Bush, and he could even tell you outright, "I'm going to invade Iraq." I couldn't tell you where the final battle would be, though. Yeah. Um, and that's just the nature of future events and, and knowledge. You can have early warning, early information, but if it's predicated on events that have not yet happened, you can't know. Yeah. And on, on that note, I mean, YouTube, something like this, I, I'm just, there's this video, if this video gets monetized, it's, it's a bug in the system, put it that way, right? We've used every boo word possible and, I think COVID or Corona has been, um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it was, here's the problem though. I mean, you as a YouTube analyst would see this immediately. It's the talk of the town. It's not the talk of the town. It's the talk of the globe, right? So everyone from left to right, far left to far right to every flavor in between needs to, wants to, has to talk about Corona, COVID, pandemic, is it then, what does YouTube do in response to this? I, un, I As I understand, some really big channels like H3H3, H3, they get away with it. 
but any channel that doesn't have connections or smaller, I assume someone like H3H, he can just place a phone call and say, you guys, can you, yeah, like. He literally you know, can do that. That's actually yeah, proven. Been, yeah, please don't steal my thunder on this. I've got a big rant in the tanks about how YouTube handled this in the beginning. Yeah, but I, any of these big users, you guys, uh, you know, just keep those Corona videos nice and keep the green going. Keep those green bags. Okay, yeah, no problem. Or is anyone smaller, even several hundred thousand, who doesn't have the connections? Because only comes, size is relevant, but the connections are more important. There's no connection for the little people, certainly not a tiny, minuscule channel like mine of uh, some 50,000 plus. Um, so basically, how do you put the clamp on the biggest news in the history of, of, of say, arguably Gen X, Millennials, and Gen Z when everyone's inclined to talk about it? Now, I guess there are arrangements with news networks. I know in Germany, the news is nonstop about it, and basically everywhere, you know, Sky News, Britain, Australia, you name it. I guess they have arrangements, but the, again, they must have some connections. Uh, even, you know, ABC in, in, in U.S., ABC, uh, Fox, whatever, it's, there's a lot of talk about it. But obviously, it's, it's a bit one-sided in that, you know, without the connections, you're kind of screwed. And it's interesting to see how YouTube is dealing with it. Because in former times, former times, as in like a half a year ago, um, a lot of the stuff that was just censored or just demonetized was just, it, it wasn't fringe fringe, but it wasn't the talk of the globe, right? So now we have a completely different uh, situation. Yeah, so, yeah, there's definitely a lot to deal with that on YouTube. Very high level, I hold YouTube as responsible for this disaster as the World Health Organization. So let's go over the timeline. Um, Mid-January, Hubei, the province, including Wuhan, goes into a lockdown. 40 million people. I checked CNN that day and I screenshot it for posterity. Posterity, I should say. Every single article on that homepage, I have it, was about Dormf and Mo impeachment. Not a word about it. That was the official line when this was going on. Not a single word about what was happening with the coronavirus and in Wuhan. I know there are a lot of people who, I mean, just truthfully speaking, global awareness under a normal fair press system would have begun mid to late January. That's when it began for me. That's when it began for a lot of attentive people. Maybe the rest of the public would have caught up early February. Here's what YouTube did during that time. They suppressed information about the coronavirus worse than they even done before, right? So they've been on a long campaign to fight against fake news and suppress alternative news uh, news sources. This is documented. This is obviously admitted in their blog posts. There's no debate here whatsoever. Uh, and I experienced this personally. I had a video about coronavirus on a channel that had half a million subscribers, and it was removed um, late January. It was just totally removed, and this was part of a larger effort to suppress information about it. Demonetization is a form of disincentivizing people from talking about it and spreading awareness and spreading information about the coronavirus. Same thing with removing videos. And they were doing that for the longest time until finally they made a big announcement like, okay, we're actually really nice and we're gonna we're not gonna take down your videos about the coronavirus anymore. Obviously, still the major news channels are getting their videos surfaced more, but I mean to their credit, it does seem that the suppression on that has tapered off a bit only after it's become a massive disaster and they still put uh, that dumb WHO uh, lower banner beneath every video, even though the WHO has cons been consistently one of the worst sources of information and direction during all of this. Um, I hold YouTube's response in utter contempt throughout this entire thing. They put a damper, they put the brakes on the knowledge spreading about it to everyone's detriment. And when this is all over in a, in a better world, they would be held responsible for what happened. It's unacceptable. Yeah. I mean, look, it's, it's the floodgates it couldn't contain the water. You know, when you have something of this scale, it's not going to work. And um, YouTube made it made its. I mean, they're still yeah, there's still the disincentive. I mean, I see people like I just accept this video. I think this video is important to make for the information for the. PayPal and Patreon.com, guys, if you want videos like this. Otherwise, I mean, you get the rest of YouTube, which is just conformist nonsense. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and but I see people saying they call it the bug or they'll use euphemisms or you know I get it. You know, and I've done that to a limited degree. But if you want to have a serious, earnest discussion, you know, no frills. You have to just you know talk 
talk I don't talk I don't blame anybody for doing what they have to do to survive on this platform. I don't I don't hold people responsible for that. It's not their no, fault. No, I, I I try to, you know, in recent videos refer to it as the crisis, but if we're going to talk about the meat and potatoes of this, it, it is what it is. And I, I think it, it's always a question of scale. You know, I I, I God's God's preserve us from something worse than COVID, and there are many things. It could be a lot, lot worse. It's very, very severe. But um, experts, yeah, point we'll, to, we'll get through this. The world will survive it. I'm yeah, fairly confident but about that. They, it just goes to show that if something's big enough, YouTube, it can't just sit back and say, "Well, you, you, you can't talk about this." All the stuff was fringe uh, up until now. Yeah, um, imagine that. Forty million people in lockdown, and it was fringe. Just because of how it was treated, you know, we we in the West, at every possible milestone, we tripped every single time. Every single time we came to a hurdle, we tripped, and here we are now. But thankfully, in spite of all this, it'll be hard. Not all of us are, all of us are going to make it, but the world itself will likely go on, despite our many mistakes. But uh, yeah, I hope we've covered the ground mostly of the things that we wanted to cover, and. Um... I hope uh, it was informative at the very least. I'm assuming uh, this video will be demonetized. If not, it's a miracle. So uh, consider Patreon or PayPal in the low bar if you uh, think that real talk like this is worth it, worth listening to. I know from Patreon. experience, it's very hard for content like this to survive on YouTube. So please do what you can to support it. I mean, every day the the tidal wave of normiedom advances on YouTube, and um, you know, this stuff like this is a rare breed from a different time. So I I don't obviously have anything to do with this but i encourage you to try to support it wherever you can whether it's this channel or any other one so everyone i will check you out later uh hopefully not in the too distant future let's uh, hope the gods are kind to us for a change and uh we get through this in one way or another and you know wash your hands remain keep your distance from people don't touch objects in public places and then rub your face that's just dumb People are doing it. Smart people. Don't be one of those smart people or dumb people. Anyway, I'll check all you guys out later and uh, until the next time. Bye-bye. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.